want to just uh, um, express a note of uh, gratitude and appreciation for the organizers and supporters of this uh, delightful and totally worthwhile um, undertaking. So uh, what, what we have here, this is a, a masterpiece by Raphael. And um, Ra Raphael, he was imagining, he, it's called the School of Athens, and Raphael was imagining all the ancient philosophers of Greece all gathered into one spot. And at the very center of this, um, of this uh, picture, this painting, are two, uh, two of the most important philosophers um, in Raphael's mind. And that is uh, Plato on the right gesturing up and uh, representing kind of the old thought, old school. And Aristotle uh, with shoes on his feet, sandals, and pointing outward like this, and uh, the young guard, kind of new thought. And the, <clears throat> you can imagine them talking about many things. And I like to think about, um, like to think that they're talking about the subject of beauty. And uh, Plato would be saying something like to Aristotle, well, I think that there's no way that we can truly understand the nature of beauty, to really fully appreciate it because beauty is something that's sort of out of our realm and all we can see are just the, the shadows of beauty, the, the kind of weak reflection of beauty. And Aristotle, he, uh, he might respond by saying something like, I don't think that's right at all. I think we totally know when something is beautiful. I think that we, um, when we see it or when we hear it or when we taste it or when we smell it, we know precisely when it's beautiful and our senses are, um, they don't lie to us and we should pay attention to them. Plato thought beauty was an ideal and Aristotle, he thought beauty was a perception. So uh, 2,000 years later, in the salons of Paris, uh, this woman here is Marquis de Lambert. She's uh, had one of the most famous salons in Paris, and this, she held this in early 1700s, 1710 or so. She got started. And uh, she had salons on Tuesday and Wednesday. And if you were lucky, you got to go on a Tuesday, because that's when all the literary types were there. And, and uh, the Wednesday was for more like the social climbers and the political types. And, but Tuesday was excellent. And on Tuesday, um, they talked about many things at the salons. They would talk about Plato and Aristotle, and they also talked about subjects that were very important uh, to thought at that time in the 1700s. In fact, from the beginning of the 1700s to 1800, that was known as the century of taste, and there was this idea that was percolating around then that, that uh, beauty, the subject that was uh, Plato and Aristotle would discuss on many occasions, that beauty was, um, was a kind of human sense, is that we sort of knew that we had the sort of intuitive capacity to recognize beauty, and uh, it was like a perception. And, but it was unclear, like, where was it actually, like in the body or in the brain, or where exactly was the sense of beauty? And so there was this thought that maybe, well, what, um, maybe we need to kind of discuss, well, what is it most like? And the thought at the time, and it was forwarded by Marquis de Lambert herself, and she wrote about it in this manuscript called Reflections on Taste. She thought that beauty, uh, the sense of beauty, was most like the sense of taste. And that term still uh, takes effect today, where we say, well, maybe that painting is not my taste or to my liking. And so uh, in, in particular, Marquis de Lambert wrote that taste is the first movement and type of instinct which draws us and guides us more surely than all the works of reason. So there was a, uh, a student of Marquis de Lambert uh, that was aware of her writing, and he uh, is uh, Austrian, and he, um, he was very obsessed with this idea of beauty and taste, and he uh, consequently put a lot of energy, he wrote this um, book called General Theory of Pleasures, and he put, uh, 
he tasted all kinds of things because he was really interested in exploring it. This idea of like this connection of gustatory taste or what we put, you know, like what does it taste like in our mouth and then what is its kind of like relationship to beauty. And he did a very unusual thing. He did, um, one time he put two pieces of metal in his mouth. He put it like a disc of copper and a disc of zinc and he put them above and below his tongue and he pressed them together and there was this unusual experience. And he, he uh, one metal kind of tasted like one thing and one metal kind of tasted like another, but together they tasted like something totally different. And he called that the taste of green vitriol. And it's, um, he was the first person to write about the taste of electricity that was being generated by these dissimilar metals in conjunction with his tongue. And he was the first, first person to write about that. And that led directly, 24 years later, to um, these two gentlemen. This is Luigi Galvani, and that's Alessandro Volta. And Galvani, he, uh, he was a, a, a botanist, and he studied frogs. He's like really into frogs. And he um, uh, uh, would, 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 would take the frog, and he, he was interested right at this point in time in his life, he was dissecting frogs, and so he would like cut the frog in half, and he put it up on a brass hook in his laboratory. And he was like poking it, right, with a metal rod, uh, iron rod, sort of see like how did the, the structure of the frog work. And, and he, it, it, accidentally, he did kind of the same thing that happened to, uh, to Sulcer. It was this uh, brass hook. It touched this iron rod and touched the frog, and the frog twitched. And that was very astonishing to Luigi Galvani. So it's like, what is going on here? It's clearly a dead frog. I'm like, have these dissimilar metals, and something is being released, some kind of magic, some kind of animal electricity, something weird and magical is associated with this like phenomena of these metals. And, and he didn't quite know what was going on, and he wrote, wrote about it as animal electricity, and he thought of it kind of being sort of like an unleashed spirit, and it was a little unclear like, actually what it was. And the, uh, there, was, and there was a group of people called the Galvanians who started following him around and espousing this idea of animal electricity. And, and they were influential to the degree that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein was based on that idea of like, kind of like the spark of life and its relationship to living things. And, and, uh, and Volta is like of a very different ilk. He heard about this stuff that Galvani was doing at the same time. And uh, Volta didn't care about frogs. He, he like, it was irrelevant, actually, frogs. And he, he thought, well, you know, maybe there's something else going on here, some, like, other issue. And he took uh, Galvani's metal, his zinc and his copper and his damp cardboard, and zinc and copper and damp cardboard, and he thought, maybe if I just use the metals in this cardboard and I keep it wet, you know, like, like an electric eel. And he, was, he knew about the electric eel, and he knew that the electric eel could, like, shock somebody. And, and he said, well, what if I put these metals in the shape of like an electric eel and I keep it damp like it's in the water? And he squirted it down with water and he made this thing here. It was called the Volta's Pile. And uh, sure enough, you touch those little terminals on the Volta's Pile, these ones at the bottom here, they, uh, you get shocked the same way that you would get shocked like if you touched an electric eel. And that uh, was like a pretty amazing thing, actually, what happened here. Because... The reason this is so critical is because and important is that electricity, which is what Volta had here, is like what he created, this Volta pile. This was, this was kind of a, a form, a way that electricity could be uh, like consistently available. And prior to this point in time, electricity was not consistently available. It was like a spark. It was like some kind of ephemeral thing, like a curiosity in the laboratory. Um, they saw lightning, of course, but that was sort of out of reach. And there was no way to study it because there was no stability to it. And so it couldn't be investigated. It was just very um, fleeting and minute. But uh, Volta's pile, which was kind of based on this idea of like sort of this investigation with the frog and animal electricity and all this stuff, was very reliable. You, as long as you kept it damp with a squirt bottle, it was like completely happy. And it produced all kinds of electricity. And they uh, started moving like uh, crazy. These Volta piles, they started going all through Europe. And all these um, scientists got hold of them. In particular, um, these two scientists, Faraday and Maxwell, uh, 
got hold of the voltapile and they put it in their laboratory and they connected wires up to it and then um, uh, you know, realized, oh, there's this like kind of relationship, right, between the electricity that's moving through the the battery and then like it attracts a compass needle. Like, what is going on? So crazy. All the stuff about electricity, like its relationship to uh, how it moves and, and it generates heat and, and uh, it, it, it like has a function as a, like, like a relationship to the magnetic field and all this kind of weird, strange stuff that was being observed for the first time. And Faraday, he was like really interested in the practical aspects of this. And Maxwell, he was very interested in the theoretical aspects of this. And Maxwell wrote all about the relations, mathematical relationships between magnetism and electricity and formulated into a series of expressions, which was the basis for all of Albert Einstein's work, like e equals mc squared and all that stuff. And Faraday, he, uh, like I said, these kind of practical thing, and he invented the electric motor, the first kind of like rotating machine. And the principles that Faraday employed were also employed in this other super critical thing. And that was related, uh, that thing basically is this kind of um, related to this idea of human nervous system extension. So, and that, uh, that happened in 1876. So there's this uh, Musi, an uh, Italian uh, inventor. He had this patent. And it was this, this is a picture from his patent. And this shows two people, and they're, they're actually far apart from each other. They're like not close to each other. And what happens is you speak into one side and then you listen in the other and then you speak in that side and then you listen in the other and this sort of exchange of information, right? And so kind of a very crude, like imagine like all the nerves in your body but kind of extending outward, right? And th this was a pretty important thing. Um, Bell ultimately uh, patented it because he had the money and Mushi did not, so uh, kind of detail, but um, the, the reason that this was important is because, like, so for the, for the first time, really, like, as any of us talk in any kind of circumstance, like, in a room, or any, any, um, in any situation, there's a kind of speed, right? Like, the movement of my lips, the movement of my tongue, my palate, uh, uh, all those aspects associated with my vocal tract, there's a kind of neurological speed that that operates at. Ionic currents flow in, in one's body to con constrict these muscles in a certain way, move the tongue in a certain way, and that speed is roughly about 8,000 bits per second is where you can kind of characterize the movement of all associated with the vocal cords. And so it's kind of a vocal track speed. It's essential speed at which we talk at like the movement of our nervous system works at that speed. And prior to this point in time, prior to 8,000 bits per second, we could maybe do eight bits a second. We could send like a telegraph, or we could send a letter, or we could ride uh, the Pony Express, or we could um, use signal mirrors, or uh, smoke, uh, smoking fires, drum beats. But uh, it was all like extremely slow. And 8,000 bits is like basically a factor of 1,000 increase in like one fell swoop. And so uh, we had the situation here with the development of the telephone where essentially vocal track speed was matched by the speed of the telephone. So really what you can think of is the telephone is, it's, it's, it's like an electron-mediated, real-time, nervous system extension of arbitrary length. And that, that was invented in 1876. So uh, in 1881, we had this sort of extremely uh, fast network development. Um, uh, first um, telephone network in 1881 happened after that. In 1882, the first power distribution network. In uh, the Dakotas, another telephone network, uh, biological analog being this kind of like neuron here. Uh, 1901, just a few years later, the first undersea uh, cable systems went in. Power systems all through the United States in the 1950s, leading us to where we are today, which is this kind of like uh, power everywhere. So what we have here is sort of like world population growth, and you can see from 6,000 BC to like basically where we are now, and then this sort of like extremely rapid step change that occurred. And what led up to this is you have this kind of like first telephone network, 1881, 1882, and then kind of like circling like this, and leading us to where we are today. 
And coincident with like uh, oil production, also occurring at exactly at the same time as if we're using these resources extremely quickly in order to support this growth. And what's fascinating about this, and a little bit coincidental, is you have this sort of like rapid change. So we're going to add 5 billion people in the space of about 50 years. And coincidentally, that's the same time period that Voyager is launched in 1977, ran out of batteries in 2025. It's almost that same time period we're going to add like this large number of people. And the United Nations, this is a plot generated by the United Nations, they think that the world's going to flat out, flatten out, the population's going to flatten out at um, maybe 11 billion people by 2100. And so the kind of the sort of change in the slope, and you can sort of think about this as like maybe in 100 years from now, we'll call it like the step or the change or the shift or, and uh, where you'll have this sort of like rapid change in human population then kind of level out and, um, and for uh, kind of comparison, I just kind of plotted bit rates of like where we are. And there's just one uh, video I wanted to show here. Like, what does this mean? Like, what is this? Where, where is this? And um, I love this, um, this video because it, it kind of is metaphor for like where we're at. And it feels like, uh, in particular, what's happening here is the dancers and they're, they have physiological expression in their body and they're being equipped with sensors that allow expression of their movement of dance into their ambient environment. So like dancing to the sounds of their own bodies, basically, or their own physiology, like dancing to their physiology. And uh, this is kind of what's happening in the world. This is like we're um, expressing ourselves this way. Our, all of our bodies are sort of expanding outward. And I'll just leave you with this one thought by Marshall McLuhan, which is that the electronically induced technological extensions of our central nervous systems are immersing us in a whirlpool of information and are thus enabling ourselves to incorporate ourselves within the whole of mankind. Thank you.